I'm Joe Sappho and I'm a burlesque and drag artist. I was a uh, little baby athlete and my dad always told me my baby's gonna go to go to college on a scholarship for hockey. He put me in dance to cross train for ice hockey and I fell in love with it. Like I was playing hockey where you put the puck in the net and that's it and I think when I got into dance it was it was always questions with like endless answers just endless questions mm. how many spins can I do what happens if I fall down <laughs> <laughs> the story of me becoming a performer I was a little baby athlete I was actually headed towards the junior Olympics for ice hockey my dad was my ice hockey coach and he always said my baby's gonna go to college on a full scholarship for ice hockey um, he put me in dance to cross train for the Junior Olympic trial team and I fell in love with dance and I quit ice hockey and I've been dancing ever since. I think me quitting hockey, yes, it did break my father's heart a little bit because it was actually a really big bond for us. My father was in and out of prison when I was a little kid and this was, he leaned into um, coaching hockey when he got sober and got out of prison and it was really our connection point it was our kind of our everything and when I chose to dance um, he kind of his image of my future kind of like dissipated and the thing that he had really gifted me was gone and but he always said to me he said um, whatever you do just do it to the best of your ability and then he started saying my little girl's gonna go to school on a full scholarship for dance. <laughs> I just, just took the same sentence and changed it to dance. Uh, my dad passed away when I was 20, so I'm talking about him in the past tense for that reason. But um, my dad, I would say, was the first feminist in my life. <laughs> I don't think he would have um, called himself a feminist. I don't think he had that language. But um, he was the person that taught me how to fight, literally hockey fight. He bought me shirts that said, don't tell me what little, what uh, sports little girls can't play. And um, yeah, he always told me, if you can't outsize them, outskate them. And he meant that not just on the ice. Mm -hmm. um, my relationship with dance evolved. A lot of it evolved out of necessity. Um, I am from a family of a lot of kids without a lot of money. And I, that's a lot of where this um, language from my dad came from of like, uh, I'm the first kid in my family that went to college. Um, in our circles, the way you go to college is through a sports scholarship. So that was always this push of um, my baby's going to go to school for hockey and then dance. So I did that. Um, I did go to, I went to NYU for dance. Um, I went to Booker T. Washington High School here in Dallas, which, thank you Booker T. Washington, you've changed my life, that school's amazing, but, um, so Booker T. Washington, then I moved to New York when I was 17 to go to NYU on a full ride, and I stayed in New York for 10 years doing the modern dance struggle, just constantly asking myself how am I going to pay my bills and keep doing this thing that I love so much until I got injured. And then um, I quit dance for a couple of years. And I would not wish that um, pain on myself again, both physically and this loss of identity um, as dancer. But from that, I learned so much um, through having experiences outside of dance that when I came back to doing burlesque and drag here in Dallas, I felt like the stuff I was making was more approachable because I wasn't just a dancer, I was human. Mm. So that was a weird squirrely evolution, but it's kind of how I got here. The injury. <laughs> what happened with the injury is um, I was actually uh, managing wellness studios in New York, one of my million jobs I did so that I could keep dancing. Um, and so I had done the yoga teacher certification, I was teaching yoga, I was managing wellness studios, all while still dancing professionally, and I overtrained and uh, 
I had got what we thought was a cartilage tear in my hip. Um, I didn't have access to healthcare because I was working a million part-time jobs and doing the dance thing. So um, the doctor I went to, uh, I forego getting my hip imaged because it was going to cost too much. And the doctor was like, no, it's very clear. It's cartilage tear based on your symptoms. We didn't do any imaging. And the doctor was like, you can keep going until it hurts too bad, and then you should probably stop. <laughs> That's how I remember it anyway. Um, so it got to a point where I was coming home from performing every night with... Um, I was coming coming home... Sorry, I slammed my foot on the ground. I was coming home um, from performing every night and putting a handle of vodka that I pulled out of the freezer onto my hip and taking a sip of it and putting it back on and it was a very dark moment for me of just realizing that the thing that I loved so much was kind of slipping away. But uh, long, you know, years later um, I ended up moving to Dallas and I wasn't dancing anymore. I quit for a couple of years. Um, because I thought I couldn't with my hip injury. And I started working at an orthopedic clinic, just a, another one of my completely unrelated side jobs. And uh, they actually imaged my hip for me. I didn't have a cartilage tear. They prescribed me a physical therapy program and told me I could dance again. Yeah. After I had grieved and lost basically my complete sense of identity as dancer, the thing I've been doing since I was like 12 years old. <laughs> I, I wouldn't I wouldn't change the path that I took. I wouldn't change it um, because I learned when I lost, when that sense of identity as dancer crumbled for me, I there's a lot that you give up to be to be a hyper trained athlete of any kind. Um, you know, I, I gave up being able to ride bikes when I was a kid because I couldn't get injured because I was trying to get that scholarship, stuff like that. And um, when I stopped being a dancer and I started being a human, this is where you should plug that song, Are We Human <laughs> or Are We Dancer? Just dub over that, maybe. <laughs> um, when I stopped being a dancer and I started being a human, um, I met more diverse people that that just weren't just dancers that weren't just in my circle and I became more than just dancer um, and then when I started dancing again the work that I made was more approachable and um, yeah even the first solo I made I was still navigating a deconditioned hip and it, my leg was really wobbly and I had somebody come up to me after the show and say there's something about the shakiness of your leg that just reminded me of the shakiness of my own stance. Yeah. Um, the drive to move back to Texas was it was purely necessity, it was survival. Um, I got married a couple days before COVID, actually, yeah, uh, before all of New York shut down. Went to the courthouse, I got married to my now ex-wife, and um, we had started her citizenship case and so a big part of that was making sure that on paper I showed consistent income to support her um, through her process and I had been bartending in a very big way in New York City and um, again this taking away of identity COVID happened all the bars closed so uh, my family is here in Dallas and I came to stay with them for a little bit until the jobs came back, but uh, ended up just shipping my stuff here and staying because I could work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was a happy accident that I ended up back in Dallas. Yeah, these radical changes in my life, I, I almost feel like that's what's forced me in or like has solidified my love of performance because I think it's the drag and the burlesque, these like pseudo amorphous characters that I take on and, and pl really play with, um, they help me navigate who I'm becoming. So, uh, and there's this wonderful, I think it's a, I think it's a Pema Chodron quote where Pema says, you know, you find the, ugh, I'm going to totally botch this, but it's something about like, you find the part of you that's indestructible 
through suffering, through challenge, and um, I think that these characters that I play with help me deal with elements that I'm that I'm still presently gra grappling with. Like I've got a um, I've got a character that I it's a giant potato, and I come out as a giant amorphous shaped potato, and then I strip that off, and I've got this gorgeous red gown on, and I look like I have very large breasts, and um, plot twist at the end, I take the dress off, and they're giant bags of potato chips, and I feed the audience potato chips. Um, and what's what I love about this accessibility element of drag and burlesque is that the audience doesn't need to know that <clears throat> I've grappled with um, feelings of, you know, of wishing I, feelings towards my own chest that are related to gender and to beauty norms, like, my whole life. And so I thought, hey, why not take it head on and just inhabit this shape and see what this feels like and play with it. So, but the audience doesn't need to know all that. And I love that. And sometimes maybe it'll resonate with somebody, but it also can just be, what <laughs> What in the world? There's a giant potato and this person's feeding me chips off their chest. <laughs> I, I never know how something is going to be received, so when I'm making the work that I make, I'm largely focused on um, internal conflict or complicating my own understanding of something. And sometimes I have to start with something very simple or two-dimensional or something I don't understand why I'm interested in it. Like, I, I made a, um, <laughs> I made a one-woman show in order to pay my legal fees when I was getting divorced because I would gotten to a place where I didn't have enough money for a lawyer. So that's really what got me back into performing when I was in Dallas is that, again, survival, necessity. I had to figure out how to make money, um, so I made a show that's called The Heartbreak Hotel, and it's a f evening length show with a like narrative theatrical plot line, and basically I just keep coming out as different hotel staff, and all of the guests of the show are wedding guests, and plot twist, the wedding doesn't happen, and there's heartbreak, but... I say often that drag and burlesque saved my life um, because I was um, I moved I moved to Dallas from New York City and when I moved here it was a combination of a little bit of culture shock even though I'm from Dallas I left when I was 17 and I lived 10 years of my life in a very different you know, social and even physical environment. I, I became an adult in New York. New York is, when someone asks me where home is, it's New York. New York made me um, who I am. And um, so with COVID happening and being displaced back to this place that I'm supposedly from, um, with the family that I have a long history of displacement and periods of time of not speaking and not being accepted um, it's very precarious and then I lost my one queer person that I really knew here my now ex-wife and I just felt completely alone absolutely alone and it was a very dark period and I didn't know if I was gonna get through that and um, really making me again like Necessity, who, I don't remember who says it, but necessity being the mother of invention, that's very true for me. Like, I, I had to give myself something to do to keep waking up each day, to get out of the house, to pay my legal fees, and so I did the thing that I can't stop doing, which is dancing. <laughs> yeah, so it saved my life there. It, it brought me, um, it brought me community, queer community here in Dallas, um, I, I, especially with COVID, a lot of shows shut down, to my knowledge, I wasn't here before, but, um, so I wasn't getting booked, um, the story I'm telling myself of why I wasn't getting booked is because people wanted something a little more classic, so I decided 
to make that space that I wanted to see and at, at Barbara's Pavilion and have found other artists that have a similar thing of needing a place to exist in their unique intersection and I found my weirdos. <laughs> I found them! <laughs> so if you're a weirdo, let's hang out. <laughs> my, my performances may differ from the, cl let's, let's go with classic burlesque. My, if we're talking about more classic burlesque in the sense of like the martini glasses and the big feather fans, um, number one, um, I don't know how to sew. I don't know how to sew. I never really learned how to do fancy makeup. So again, necessity, I'm like a dollar store queen. Um, I didn't have a budget, like I didn't have, again, didn't have a lot of money when I was getting started. So there's this element, this kind of makeshift element of what can I make with what I have. And I have this joke that I'm held together with like duct tape and hot glue because my costumes really are. But there's this element of, of them falling apart uh, that again is accessible where it's like when you come see me perform, I've literally got candy glued onto a corset and pieces of it are going to fall off and that's okay. Um, and it's also okay if you fall apart sometimes too is I guess what the kind of undertone of um, making magic from whatever you have, even if it's just the hot glue gun and the dollar store. Because I, I think it can be a little um, inaccessible sometimes, and, and that is theater magic. When you go see that classic act with the amazing martini glass and the beautiful feather fans, it can be this fantasy world of, oh, if only my life was like that. But I hope when people come to my shows, there's an element where it's like, wow, I never thought about, you know, taping nerds boxes to my chest as a bra. That's cool. Maybe I should try it. Okay, but don't try these things at home. <laughs> but do if you want to. But it might get weird. <laughs> Disclaimer. So I often say that queerness is in the bones of burlesque. And I think this element of satire is, um, I, it's just, it's so delicious. It's so delicious. Um, because it, 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 it indicates conflict. Um, and I think that, that conflict is where, is where the delicious stuff is. And when I say delicious stuff, I mean the confusion. I say often that it's okay to be confused. We all are. Um, and so I think there's this element for me in working in, in drag and burlesque, and especially with my limited ability with what costumes that I'm talking about, is um, I'm kind of poking fun at myself, my own capacities, uh, my own desires. Like with the chip act, I this it's like, why do I want to take on what about like, what is this conflict I'm having with my shape? Like, what do I want? And maybe I can figure it out by playing with it, by making fun of, not taking myself too seriously and not being too precious. So, <laughs> yeah. Should I tell you just like my favorite costume? Sure. Oh gosh. Well, what do we have here? Okay. I really, this act that I made, I don't know if it's, um, I made an act recently. I was, I was, um, really, I've been very conflicted with if I should call myself a drag king um, because I am very conflicted with my own gender and pronouns. Um, there's a really incredible poet named Andrew Gibson who I love. Also poetry is a huge part of my personal practice. Um, and Andrew Gibson in one of their poems says my, prono like, my pronouns haven't been invented yet. Yeah, I was like, ugh. And it's amazing. Um, but I, I made an act recently that I was having trouble calling myself a drag king, so I was like, let me just take this head on. I'll make an act where I'm literally a king. Um, but I had this wedding dress, and I was like, what if I 
am a bearded lady that becomes a king. So I did a reverse strip tease from my wedding gown to um, a king outfit complete with a beard. And I did it to Florence and the Machines um, King. It talks a lot about um, this conflict between certain expectations of being like what it means to be a woman and what it's like to exist as a, a female human that maybe wants to inhabit their gender and physicality a little differently. I really love my hot dog vendor costume. Mm. It's um, complete with actual hot dogs that I serve to audience members. I feel like it's this hilarious parallel of I'm literally going to give you hot dogs because I want to like I want to nourish you with my art. Um, but I bought like a, a heating lunch box that I bring the hot dogs in so that they're warm when the people get them. I know. I just details like that are so special to me and when people notice them like they come up to me after the show and they're like the hot dog was warm I'm like thank you I care about you so much <laughs> I want your hot dog to be warm yeah I love that costume oh. so, yes generally speaking drag king is the cross-dressing of a female human as a I don't even know if I should say female human as male human woman is man, it all gets a little squirrely, but generally a female person that is dressing in masculine dress, um, I would say that is my very scientific definition of it. Um, it's my best attempt, but we're going to go with drag in between for me. I, I for example, with my work, um, and a lot of it again is just grappling with how I feel day to day, is... Um, I like to wear corsets. That's not something that drag kings classically do because if we're, if you have a female body, you generally, you know, maybe you have a bit more curve than a male body. And so if we are trying to create an illusion of having a male form, we're probably not going to cinch the waist in and create this kind of iconic feminine shape. But I like to wear corsets. I think there's a certain element that's very masculine about corsetry. I mean, there's there's steel in there, and I think steel itself is incredibly masculine and very, there's, if you haven't worn a corset, it's, it's very interesting. If you haven't been tied into a corset, very interesting experience. Um, the first time I was fitted for a corset was in New York at this place called Orchard Corsets, and the woman who fit me, I'd never been properly fit for a corset, or like tied into it in the like, I guess, the way that corsets are supposed to be tied and this lady grabs the strings and just throws me forward and like I, I caught my weight and she was like no let me throw you and I was like okay throw me and <laughs> throw me and catch me um but yeah I think there's just just a very masculine element of of corsets and I have a really vivid memory of I was doing an amateur drag night here in Dallas and I was in the dressing room I think there was one other king there and everybody else was queens and this queen said to me I was tying my corset and she said why are you wearing a corset you're a drag king and I was just like because I want to wear a corset like I was just very surprised um, and I do think it's important even in spaces that are generally you know radically accepting that we continue to question ourselves question maybe certain stuckness of our own ways and perceptions of things because um, you know had I maybe been a little more self-conscious maybe I wouldn't ever have worn a corset again and I like the way they feel and I want to show that it can be masculine <laughs> now, uh, for anyone that is wanting to perform number one it is like for me it is the highest compliment when people come up to me after a show and say they want to do that. Like that, that to me, I'm like, okay, I did it. That's like my, that's like my measure of success. I know that I have created something that it, that somebody has seen themselves in what I'm doing. Yeah. It's, 
this is maybe a, a squirrely side story, but my first burlesque teacher, I would say like the, the first teacher I had that I was like, oh, kind of really got me into burlesque, Joe Boobs, Joe Boobs, oh my gosh, Joe Boobs has the burlesque handbook. Anyone interested in doing burlesque, get Joe Boobs' book. Okay. Joe Boobs said to me <laughs> something, and it's in, it's in her book, that like every rhinestone that you put on costume is like winking at the audience. Mm. And I also think of it as like reflecting back their splendor. If, if somebody has seen in my work a bit of their own like humanity, if they feel a little less alone, I've done my job. I've done it. So yes, if you come see my show and you want to do it, please come up to me. And I'm, I'm that person that's like, you want to do it? Let's go. You want to borrow costumes? Let's go. Maybe too much sometimes, but um, yeah, I would say anyone that's wanting to get into burlesque, like, in a, like, in a, I don't want to say a serious way, uh, because I try not to take anything too seriously, but, um, don't be afraid to walk up to the person you see and tell them that you're interested in doing it. Um, I, it's such a hard thing to be an artist that I think artists are so willing to share what resources they have, whether it's connections to people that are doing shows or makeup tricks or whatever. It, we all know how hard it is <laughs> and we just want to help each other out. Maybe that's flowery and that's not how everyone is, but I have definitely seen that especially in burlesque and drag. The odds are already against you, so you gotta, you gotta help each other out. Oh. If I had to give my younger self advice, um, I would probably be, I probably was 17, um, which is when I moved to New York, and I would tell my younger self, it's, it's okay to get lost. In fact, I would probably, like, I was a real, I was a real tough cookie, especially when I moved to New York, and I was queen of burning myself out just because I had lived in this state of like survival mode for so long that and I I have done incredible things I'm really proud of myself but I would tell that little little baby Joe I'd be like it's okay to get lost and it's okay to take breaks like you actively need to depart from the things that you care about sometimes in order to not burn out on them in order to do it forever and always so success is a really can be a overwhelming and like kind of pressuring thing sometimes where it's like am I doing enough am I good enough um, and I just keep for me I return back to my values and I say am I committed to what I'm doing am I staying curious and it keeps me going yeah so I would just invite others to if that's helpful you know are, are you living in a way that you're committed to the thing you care about and are you still curious about it yeah Um, would you be interested in having the poem? Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it might be... Have my bangs been crazy this whole time? They've been perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly wild bangs. <laughs> um, okay, cool. I'll do my poem, I guess. Um, so I wrote this poem, like, shortly after I, I had got Barb's burlesque going, and really, I, it was a very self-serving thing of, like, finding my people and making friends, finding my queer community. <laughs> I needed friends, so I made a place to make friends. <laughs> how, how unique of an idea. That's such good advice for all of us. Yeah, I'm that person that walks up to somebody, I'm like, hey, you want to be my friend? <laughs> <laughs> I do, too. That's me. <laughs> Life's just a playground. <laughs> yeah, just everyone's, a playground. like, splattering to be yeah, honest. You know? Hell yeah. Um, but I wrote this one because I wrote it while I was um, driving one of the box trucks during my muggle job and um, don't worry I had both hands on the wheel I was not like with my feather quill writing I was just <laughs> in my head but I was feeling just an overwhelming sense of gratitude um, to have finally 
not like to not feel alone um, and to feel like I had a group of people to support and contribute and share time with. So I wrote this for them and I feel like it's really timely for Pride. It um, <clears throat> goes like this. This is for those that don't feel at home in their homes of biology. I failed that class in high school. I could never figure out how to fit the roundness of my disco ball soul into my Punnett square. Puns, tits, I love both. <laughs> punted. And when I say punted, I mean the name you were gifted while the womb stretched and the box you were born into that you bent yourself to fit as you grew in spite of those that wouldn't let you tear yourself open, stretch out and show all the beautiful things inside. Well, I hope you make a mess now of tacky paper and satin bows and glittery ribbons. I hope you make a mess all over the floor and leave it. Leave it on the dance floor at the gay club with the disco ball spinning overhead sending spotlights on everyone around you that outgrew their boxes too. They are there to remind you that you are not alone. Lone Lighthouse beaming a queer color through the gray fog of normalcy, guiding those lost at sea to you to land. And if they swam far and they are tired and tangled in seaweed and other man-made matters, like those sad sea turtles that spend so much of their life with straws in their noses choked with plastic, give them your knife and help them cut off and cut out anything and anyone that holds them back. Never hold back who you are becoming. What is your name? No, really, what is your name? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's my disco ball name? <laughs> Whatever name you want to give me. It's Moonlight. Moonlight. Yeah. Your name is becoming. Thank you for coming. Yeah. <laughs> That's my poem for my queer home, which is in other people in other spaces, so. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for letting me share it. <laughs>